Welcome to Season 5 of Public Health On Call, a podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. I'm Joshua Sharfstein, Vice Dean for Public Health Practice and Community Engagement and a former health commissioner here in Baltimore, Maryland. Our goal with this podcast is to bring scientific evidence and experience to shed light on critical health issues. If you have questions or ideas for us, please send an email to publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. Hey, listeners, it's Lindsay Smith-Rogers, producer of Public Health On Call. And for two years, we've brought you COVID-19 and public health news. But the podcast is just one of the ways you can learn more about the evidence and experts from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. If you like what we've been doing on the podcast, please consider subscribing to our e-newsletter, Expert Insights, which publishes on Tuesdays and Fridays. The newsletter contains the latest on how we're working to understand, manage, and eventually end the COVID-19 pandemic and prepare us for future outbreaks. We also cover the school's groundbreaking research and insights on climate change, mental health, racism, opioids, gun violence, and more. You can find our work at publichealth.jhu.edu slash subscribe. That's publichealth.jhu.edu slash subscribe. We so appreciate you being part of our public health community. Today, I speak with Dr. Allison Arwady, the health commissioner of the city of Chicago. We discuss the city's robust approach to battling COVID, which included ranking neighborhoods by risk level. We also talk about how public health departments can maintain their energy and commitment for so many months. Let's listen. Dr. Allison Arwady, thanks so much for joining me on Public Health On Call. Not too long ago, I went to a U.S. Conference of Mayors meeting and I sat next to Chicago Mayor Lori Lightfoot and she gave a wonderful presentation on Chicago's work during the pandemic. And I had a chance to meet her afterwards. um, And I said, uh, what's your secret? And she said, Dr. Allison Arwady. So (laughs) I immediately said, we're going to get her as a guest on Public Health On Call. How are you doing? I'm well. Thanks for having me. So um, Mayor Lightfoot um, talked about some pretty interesting and innovative efforts in Chicago on the pandemic. And I want to turn the mic over to you. Tell me about one of them. Sure. So when I think about the mayor, right from the beginning, she was interested in data, interested in public health and really focused on the equity issues, which we as a health department were already very focused on. And so I think about right at the very beginning of the pandemic, in those first few weeks of shutdown and everything is sort of on fire, um, you know, the mayor made the decision to start a racial equity rapid response team. And we don't usually think about racial equity as being a rapid response, but it was this infusion of we're going to bring in folks from communities. We're going to listen to whatever they say we need to be doing differently. We're going to be adjusting what we do week after week, very much with an equity lens. Um, And what started Started with a group of interesting folks really grew into our, our whole strategy here in Chicago, where equity was not just part of the strategy, it really is the entire strategy. And sort of being community-led, trusting that I'm not, the government is often not the best spokesperson for vaccines or for what needs to happen in Chicago. It's about getting those community voices activated, but also supported and funded. And I think we've really grown some pretty amazing networks here in Chicago as a result. So um, tell me how that played out. Let's take that first challenge. One of the first challenges was, was testing as well as contact tracing. Yep. What did you do differently as a result of this um, approach? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, for one thing, yes, well before vaccine was available, as part of Protect Chicago, we're pulling in a lot of these different community organizations, uh, providing funding to be doing the sort of door knocking that we had we knew how to do as a result of either activating voters or we'd just done census, if you think about that. And so using census track level information, making sure that in the communities using data, we knew we're going to be hardest hit. I mean, we'd knocked on 400,000 doors before there was ever vaccine. So getting some of that going around resources, uh, making sure that where folks had need for quarantine or isolation or food or help with work notes or childcare, uh, that we were building some of that and 
building that trust. And when it came time to hire for contact tracing, as, as you probably remember, there was a lot of pressure to move very quickly. Um, and we said, if we are going to be making the largest investment the health department has ever made, the biggest grant we've ever given, I'm sorry, that's not going to a call center that might not even be in Chicago. That's not going to a university. This is the opportunity to create jobs and public health related jobs in the communities that we have long needed community health worker types in. And so um, we put out a grant, the Chicago Cook Workforce Partnership, which is our federal uh, program to help people get connected to jobs who previously may have had barriers to employment was the lead. And then what we did is we actually funded 30 community-based organizations on our south and west sides of Chicago, which tends to be where um, people have the most most barriers to health, the least connection, um, the highest rates of chronic disease, et cetera. And those 30 organizations in turn were each hiring, you know, 15, 20 people. That became our contact tracing core. These are folks by definition, no educational requirement. We did an earn as you learn through our city colleges. You just had to be good at talking to people, good at sort of making those connections. And that we kept a lot of the case investigation with the health department and then also actually through our providers recognizing that who picks up the phone. And then this contact tracing core turned into our vaccine ambassador core, turned into our call center. They've, you know, we've hired more than 800 folks through that. And they have been the lifeblood of everything that has been best. And they are all folks who had never been in public health, but are very much from the hardest hit communities. And we want them here long term. Well, there's a lot to talk about, but very exciting work. I'm going to just go back to something you said that very early on, you were knocking on doors, hundreds of thousands of doors. When the door opened, what did you say? What were the key things at the beginning that Chicago focused on? Yeah. So at that point, the thing we were most interested in, frankly, was that the person who is opening the door to have the conversation about COVID is someone who has some connection to the person behind the door. So we really wanted, we were, this is where we were working with, whether it was in some cases, faith-based, in some cases, social service-based, in some cases, uh, employment-based, really trying to be quite hyper-local, even from the very beginning. So the Puerto Rican Cultural Center is the one reaching out in the heavily Puerto Rican areas. And at that point, it was about, you know, we had some basic information, but it was about here's what you should do, you know, if you're concerned about COVID. Here's how we can help you get testing. Here are the ways you can get support. You need to know that there is a federally qualified health center here. Can we get you set up if you don't have health care in case you get COVID? If somebody does, here's isolation and quarantine. Here's food support. Here's, you know, this idea to kind of use the COVID as the entry. And, you know, we were handing out PPE and, you know, some of the other practical things, but it was as much about starting to make a connection uh, and and let, making sure people knew where they could call if they had resource needs. Got it. Now I want to circle back to another thing that you said, which was that you really wanted to um, take a little bit more time, hire people from Chicago to be your workforce for the COVID outreach and not hire a call center somewhere. Were there companies showing up and saying, hey, we could do it tomorrow, just to write us a check? Oh, yeah. Lots of them. I mean, my email was full. I mean, the whole country was looking. We'd just gotten money from the federal government. The whole country is trying to sort of stand up contact tracing. And there were a lot of opportunities. You know, I, the state used more of a call center approach, et cetera. And I recognize that that is that's the quickest way to get it done. But I'm not I wasn't interested. We weren't interested in just sort of having somebody on the phone. Now, the mayor said something about this at that event that I uh, heard her speak at. Uh, she used a phrase which she said was her own personal mantra during the pandemic. And it started like this, no temporary scaffolding. Scaffolding. OK, <laughs> well, I'm just testing to see whether uh, those two. So no temporary scaffolding. Uh, what does that mean? How does that apply to your approach to contact tracing? Yeah, that's been our approach all along that I do not want to use. I mean, this has been a terrible pandemic. It has also been a probably once in a generation opportunity for public health 
to build up some of the infrastructure and for cities to help think about how we address some of the inequities that have always been there, but really came to light, I think, for a lot of people for the first time in serious ways during COVID, thinking about what's an essential worker, what does that mean, et cetera. And so all along, my team has worked very hard to say, not just what do we need this week or this month, but what does this look like in the future? I have a really good emergency preparedness team. We were in better shape than I would argue just about anywhere in the country leading into this, having millions of, you know, the masks, the N95 for hospitals and store, et cetera. And that team and others have really been charged with thinking about down the line, even in a multi-year way. And so for that contact tracing, for example, um, yes, the contact tracing money, of course, will end. As we were getting some vaccination money, we transitioned sort of that group into our community COVID response core. They're continuing on. Do you know They actually, we now have a completely Chicago-based call center that are still people from those neighborhoods, right? So we've been filling the needs that we have. But long-term, we've set up these healthy Chicago equity zones. The whole city is divided into seven regions. We're funding lead organizations, in some cases, a healthcare organization, in some cases, a social service organization, in turn, are funding small community-based organizations in every community. They've been doing vaccine, but they're getting funded longer term with other funding we've received. They're each choosing a sort of public health chronic disease issue, whether it's breast cancer mortality, food access, and building this sort of community muscle and infrastructure. So all the time, you're working on these public health issues. And then if you need to for a pandemic or an emergency, you can convert some of that heavily community based workforce into the what the city needs long term. This is, you know, we've told them this is this is this is our long term plan um, really for community engagement at the health department. And it started from COVID. Got it. So instead of just writing a check to a company that would come in and go away right away when the money's gone, you are looking forward to having potentially hundreds more people from Chicago community health workers, in a sense, involved in all kinds of activities to make Chicago a healthier city. Right. And in the same way, I don't want us doing the work of let me call and just see if we can get you a vaccine if we're not also working to say, are you connected to health care, right? If you're uninsured or what are your issues there? Let's get that sorted. Let's get you connected to your federally qualified health center. Do you have chronic diseases? Can we get those under control? What else can we do sort of in your neighborhood really thinking about the long term here. We had uh, Chicago Department of Public Health before COVID. We were completely set up as a department to be focused on the racial life expectancy gap in Chicago. Black Chicagoans before COVID live about nine years less long than white Chicagoans. That's completely unacceptable. It's preventable. Um, but it takes this sort of focused work. And so in the COVID response core, something like 63 percent of the folks who were hired um, were black in that group. Group, which which is more than double what the what that percentage would be uh, demographically for the city of Chicago, but that's where we need the most work. That's where we need to you know work together to build the trust, get the resources, and so it's about economic development at the same time as sort of public health growth, uh, and it really fits into the mayor's larger agenda for the city. Now I'm sure um, there have been challenges along the way. Many cities have experienced misinformation, disinformation. What have been some of the issues that have come up in Chicago and, and how have you dealt with them? Yeah. So, you know, every month, as you know, has brought a different challenge in some ways. One thing that I think about from relatively early on in the vaccine rollout there was a lot of enthusiasm for vaccine, as you remember, um, especially at the beginning. And we saw, you know, we started here in Chicago, just like everybody else did with the healthcare workers. Of course, that's who we most want to get vaccinated. Um, and we're working hard to get healthcare workers vaccinated. But we were seeing in that data uh, that same sort of uh, racial gap that we were concerned about. And our early data, both starting with kind of those healthcare workers, and then as we moved into seniors, was exactly the opposite, right, of what a, sort of an equity focus makes sure that vaccine is getting into communities. So, of course, you want all your healthcare workers vaccinated, no question of that. But we were worried about what this was going to mean long term. And so we made a decision here. Protect Chicago was our whole program. Protect Chicago Plus, we created an, I, I know a lot of people we're using social vulnerability indices, but we made one here in Chicago, Chicago COVID vulnerability that wasn't just, you know, where's the economic, where is this? We really looked at things like 
Where do we have crowded housing? Where do we have a high percentage of people in the essential worker jobs that can't work from home? We looked at some of our anonymous mobility data. Uh, so we knew where in the city people had been able to more or less stay home and hadn't. We looked at um, where people in Chicago reported they had primary care physicians and didn't. And then, of course, we looked at COVID burden. So 77 communities in the city, low, medium or high vulnerability. The highest 15, we said at the time when the entire world wanted wants vaccine, these 15 communities, A, they get extra only for people in these communities, and B, everybody over the age of 18 gets a vaccine now in these communities at the time when you had to be 65 or had some, you know, in the rest of the city. And let me tell you, these are not the communities that typically go first, if you know what I mean. They're not going to be the ones to raise their hands first. And boy, did we get a lot of pressure for that, because it's one thing to sort of talk about co-prioritizing. It's another one to say, these are the communities most driving our outbreak. These are the communities from an epidemiologic perspective and from an equity perspective. We want to get on top of this in the city, getting these folks vaccinated, including the ones who are out working every day. And so that was a major pushback, city council, et cetera. But it was the right thing. And it's sort of this putting your money where your mouth is when it comes to equity and prioritizing what you need to for public health. Were you able to to see the effect of that strategy? Yeah, we did. Yeah, we saw really good. You know, so, some of these same communities were the ones where we'd done a lot of the door knocking. Um, and as we were making it available, first, you see you see good uptake, right? You start to see this improvement. You know, we're at a point now in Chicago where Latinx Chicagoans are, Latinx adults are as likely as white adults to have been vaccinated. That is not at all where we were, right? When we were starting. We're still lagging uh, somewhat on black Chicagoans, but we're making progress. Uh, and some of the other things we, you know, we, we've we initiated a um, at-home vaccination program. So that's another thing. We saw that black Chicagoans sometimes were not coming out to pop up events, etc. cetera, uh, did focus groups, did work, started with a small program for homebound folks, expanded it to seniors. And since last June, anybody in the city of Chicago, any age, we will bring vaccine to your house Monday through Sunday, morning, afternoon or night. We'll vaccinate up to 10 people. Um, and the highest uptake that we have seen of that is in the neighborhoods where we most needed to see improvements in vaccine. So it's been this like what works, what doesn't work, and then trying to quickly change your strategy to meet the goals that 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 are needed. And sometimes the things you think are going to work are not the things that work and vice versa. That is very, very interesting. Let me just ask personally, this has been very hard for a lot of health officials. I'm sensing that lack of energy is not your biggest challenge. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> um, but I wonder how you have been able to sustain this level of energy for two years in the pandemic. Yeah. So, I mean, one thing is this is what I have most been trained in the world to do. I did epidemic intelligence service with CDC. I've always been sort of an infectious disease interested person. I still remain very intellectually interested, even though it's been physically uh, and just it's been obviously just a really difficult time. My team is amazing. Um, and then the other thing, and I, and I think it's important to say this because I do not at all take for granted. I know you started out by saying you were sitting next to the mayor. I think what I've seen in this country is a lot of times politicians only want to own the good news. They want to stand up when it's time to take the mask off. They want to stand up when we can reopen and things are good. And if things are not good, I've seen a tendency to sort of point to the public health um, system or leaders as like, the bad folks, right? The ones who are making us do this. And, you know, here in Chicago and, and broadly in Illinois, I feel like I've been able to sort of co-own both the hard and the happy decisions um, in a way that has felt supported. And yes, it's been really hard in a lot of ways. Yes, I have 24-7 police outside my house because I've had a lot of negative issues going on. Um, but at the end of the day, like, I'm excited that we've been able to take this terrible pandemic. And over these last two years, we've not only been responding to the moment, but we really are getting some stuff done for the long term here. Um, that is what we need to do as a city for Chicago. Well, I now fully understand uh, why Mayor Lightfoot is so proud of the work that you've done during the pandemic. And I just want to just ask you this, this final question, you know, in, in rapid fire form, what are you most proud of? 
Oh, I'm, I'm, I am most proud of my team. 100%. They have shown up day after day, done two and three persons jobs and just gotten it done in creative and flexible ways. And we would not be here without the folks at CDPH. Well, um, Dr. Arwadi, thank you so much for joining me today on Public Health On Call. Thanks for having me. Public Health On Call is produced by Joshua Sharfstein, Lindsay Smith-Rogers, and Stephanie Desmond. Audio production by Niall Owen McCusker, Matthew Martin, Spencer Greer, and Holly Cardinal, with support from Chip Hickey. Distribution by Nick Moran. Production support from Catherine Ricardo. Social media support from Grace Holes Fernandez. Thank you for listening. Thank you.